Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Now we are going to talk about the technology revolution. If you are excited about artificial intelligence, you might be surprised what is coming next. Israelis call it bioconvergence, McKinsey call it biorevolution, some even call it the fifth industrial revolution. Steve Jobs also had some fantastic thoughts about it, but I will let our speakers tell you more about it. Today I'm very happy to introduce a very globally renowned scientist from the genetic field, the long-standing director of Serbian Institute of Molecular Genetics and Genetic Engineering, the president of the governing board of International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, and now the Minister of Science, Innovation and Technological Development from the Republic of Serbia, Dr. Jelena Begovic. Please come to the stage. Yes. The other great speaker for today comes from a very different environment. He's a venture investor. He comes from London, from UK. He's founder of Salvage Ventures and a venture partner of Mubadala Life Science Fund. The last information I got is that it is worth 1.1 billion pounds. So please welcome Alasdir Tong, who will start the speech. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to listen to us today. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the biotechnology revolution and how the changes in the, over the last 10, 20 years will fundamentally change the world in the future. For most of human history, biology has been trial and error. And by trial and error, what we mean is that we were limited by what we could observe with the human eye and what we could do with our hands. Um, it, was, it took a very long time for us to be able to realize that there was more to, the, literally more than meets the eye. And healthcare and, ther and um, treatment was often relied on mysticism or tradition rather than science. And our ancestors now would probably look at what we have ever achieved scientifically and think that it was crazy. But as we can see, Arthur C. Clarke once said, any, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. What changed over the last couple of hundred years is that we invented and created enabling technologies that have allowed us to go deeper and allows us to see more than meets the eye. Tools like the microscope, as you can see, allowed us to see cells and microorganisms. Enabling technologies such as electricity and temperature control also enabled us to have a very deep view of science in a way that, frankly, as I said before, our ancestors would never have been able to do. Things really, really advanced further in the 1980s, in particularly around um, commercial technologies and companies which created biologic therapies. In particular, Amgen and Genentech, two large American companies with the creation of Epoetin Alpha and Somasotin, whereby they were able to manufacture these products in living cells, in uh, Chinese hamster ovary cells and, and bacterial cells, by inserting the gene, um, a, a gene basically, which allows them to produce certain products. And you can think of this in a similar way to how a factory might use a set of schematics to produce a particular product. This was basically done in, in biology and, and has created a wave of new technologies and new products across healthcare, life sciences, environment, climate, and materials. Now we exist in a different way in 2023 where biology is not just a biotechnology, but biology is, exists as a technology. And what I mean when I say this is that as you can see from the picture here, there are a number of different um, analogies that we can take, and one of them is building. If you're a builder who just has a hammer, you can, you're limited to building things in a very, very one-dimensional way, simply by hammering things. And you're limited also by the creativity you can have and everything else, and, and that represents really the rocks that you have there. This is the trial and error biology that I described earlier. It's very challenging to know what you don't know, and without the tools to see properly, you, you can't do more. The image in the middle represents biotechnology, such that with multiple tools, such as a spade, a hammer, a screwdriver, and other hand tools, you can build intermediately complicated projects, such as a house, um, as an example. But you're, again, limited by what the human body is able to achieve and what those tools are able to do. In contrast, the last picture represents modern construction. In order to build a skyscraper, you need many modern technologies and, and, and tools which didn't exist a long time ago. Hydraulic cranes, modern architecture techniques, um, fancy materials and regulations in order to make sure that standards are kept. This would be biology as a technology that I described earlier, in that with um, a culmination of build-up of multiple technologies which are extremely complicated, you can build projects 
which are frankly solving very, very large problems which would have been unthinkable before. And to take some examples of projects which have created biology as a technology, you, I've got three examples here. The first being the Human Genome Project. This was a project that started in 1984 and functionally mapped all of the roles and structures of genes in the human body. It was functionally completed in 2001, and by 2021 had a 9.7% completion of both structure and, and function of human genes. Enabling technologies and tools to, to build this included things like PCR sequencing, uh, bioinformatics, and otherwise. And again, without those things put together and combined, you would, we would not be able to have the precision medicines with genetics that exist today, such as Herceptin, a very powerful breast cancer treatment which is, relies on genetics to target. A second example could be AlphaFold, which is a slightly more modern example. This was the um, solving of all the protein structures and confirmations done by Google DeepMind, completed in 2020. Similar to the Human Genome Project, this will enable a whole new revolution in proteomics and protein-targeted therapeutics, which again would not be possible without many enabling technologies, such as long-read sequencing, again, PCR sequencing and otherwise, which combine, when combined together, um, and, and computational biology, structural biology, et cetera. Um, and by combining these things together, again, we were able to create a tool and an atlas which, would, which we would not have been able to do before. The last example I have up here is uh, CRISPR, which is a gene editing technology, a far more advanced version of, of uh, being able to edit a genome of a living organism compared to what Amgen and Genentech pioneered in the 1980s. Similar to the other two, it's an enabling technology that will enable fundamentally life-changing treatments for humans, but separately also acts in a slightly different way in that it's a pair of molecular scissors compared to the Human Genome Project and AlphaFold, which could be much more viewed as schematics and, and an atlas. This has really all been enabled by um, interdisciplinary um, convergence of multiple areas of both life sciences, biotechnology, IT, et cetera, as well as uh, a number of trends such as the falling cost of sequencing, um, cheap GPUs with incredible power, advanced al artificial intelligence algorithms and otherwise. And in the future, we expect that these things will continue to converge and continue to build fundamentally well, changing um, technologies and products across all sorts of different areas, not just life sciences and healthcare and therapeutics. So to recap, as I talked about before, we understood biology as trial and error for the longest time. There was the birth of biotechnology about 40 years ago, whereby we could edit and change cells to create products. And now in 2023, we expect to enter a golden era of biotechnology where biology is used as a technology, when new industries are created, disrupted and reinvented. And some of the issues that we'll hopefully we'll, we'll try and solve with this revolution in biotechnology, we can see above. We're gonna hit a global population of almost 10 billion by 2050. There's gonna be a, almost a 50% increase in global cancer deaths by 2030. Almost 20% of adolescents in the US are obese and are gonna suffer from diseases like um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, fatty liver disease, cancer, et cetera. And still to this day, 31% of all premature deaths worldwide come from cardiovascular disease. And this includes war, famine, pestilence, and everything else in between. There are still huge problems that need to be solved, and biotechnology and biology as a technology will do these things. This is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity for reinvention and economic gain. As a result of this, for this golden era, it isn't just about the technology. There's, there will be a new generation of life scientists and entrepreneurs with both very different priorities and very different backgrounds that will innovate materials and processes that have never existed before. And what I mean by this is, Similar to what um, Premier Lee mentioned in the, in the plenary session this morning, entrepreneurship will look very different in the future, and not just in tech, in life sciences as well. Science in 2023 has generally been not equal at a global level, and actors who are able to improve global development of science and life science and biotechnology need to act together and cooperate in order to build a, you know, this future that we're talking about a little bit now. So how are we able to capture and prepare for this revolution in biology and the changes that it will bring? I can only speak for myself as an investor, but there, we, we see so many interesting opportunities in such a way now that didn't exist 10 years ago. But I would like to now hand over to Her Excellency Minister Begovic to talk a little bit about one country in Europe and how they are developing and building this huge revolution in biotechnology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So there are two questions uh, that should follow this. Why should we prepare and when? 
So uh, the answer to the first one is not only the biology and scientists will be influenced by this revolution in biology. We have to be aware that our economies, uh, our social systems, and every single each individual on this planet will be influenced by this revolution. The second question is when to become when to become, uh, when to start the preparations. So the best answer is, of course, well, the best time was 12 years ago. The second best time is today. So we shouldn't wait. So why 12 years ago? Well, 12 years ago, I always refer to Steve Jobs. I take him as a big uh, visionary of our time a person who really influenced our lives on regular everyday basis. So he foreseen that the merging between biology and technology, between life sciences and uh, ICT is a new revolution and a new era that is coming. Although now we can say it's already here. So today we have companies that transferred big factories, we're talking about thousands of square meters, 10,000 square meters, to microns, to living organisms. We have companies that are offering the production of any kind of compound in a living organism. Then when you see that uh, companies or agencies like uh, Boston Consulting Group or McKinsey are talking about biotech, and synthetic biology as something that is coming, it's around the corner and it's going to change the industry. It's going to move trillions of dollars within the economies. Well, half of the population is very happy and I'm the one half of it. But the second part of the population gets a little bit scary. So what is happening? What is going to happen with our societies? What is going to happen with our jobs? What is going to happen with our economies. So definitely the consulting and financial groups are talking about biotech. So this is happening and this is going to influence our lives. So let's see how we can prepare. I am speaking from the point of a minister of science of a small country on Balkans, in Europe, on this planet. So this is the country with a, I would say, almost a perfect spot on this globe because it's a spot where east and west meet, north and south meet. It's a country where you don't, always, you don't need visas to come to, the, to come to Serbia, whether you come from India, from China, from United States, Europe, all around the world. So it's a perfect spot to start something that should grow to become international base of development. And we definitely, as a government, came to the decision that we're going towards the development of bioeconomy to development new bio hub in Europe. So, so far for past seven to 10 years, we invested heavily in innovation system through building science technology parks, through building different small innovation centers, because as a small country, we want to reach every single entrepreneur, every single innovator, every single scientist within our country. We need them all. So we want to gather them and we want to bring them together around one idea. And this is the building of a new innovation ecosystem in our country. Uh, in parallel, of course, we have a huge and long successful history in education and success in science in STEM, particularly in STEM areas. So we are building the ecosystem for the future development. We're investing heavily in national data center, supercomputers. So we are trying now to put together all the pieces of the puzzle that we already have. Together with the World Economic Forum, 
We opened a center for the fourth industrial revolution, third one in Europe, 16th in the world. And we are focused in this center on biotech and AI because we see these actually as a fifth industrial revolution. So the convergence between ICT, AI, and life sciences. Why these four key, key areas of life? Because these are the major challenges. Healthcare system, food production and agriculture, energy and environment protection. This is something that concerns all the countries in the world. This is something that concerns every single individual on this planet. So we are building a Bio4 campus. It's a platform for collaboration. It's a platform where we are bringing together academia, private sector, government, all the gray cells that we have in the country and all the infrastructure that we have in the country and in big investments in this Bio4 campus. Bio4 comes from biomedicine, biotechnology, bioinformatics and biodiversity. So four bios as we see the future development of our country. So what are we doing? We are actually not starting from the zero. As I mentioned, we have excellent science. We have an army of scientists. We're just putting them together for the collaboration. We're putting six faculties, nine research institutes. We're also building a new scientific uh, science technology park for the support of startup community, for the support of startup community in the area of biotech and AI, because our country uh, showed immense success in the development of ICT industry. This is our second export field. So we already have, again, all the pieces of the puzzle. Behind me, you will see how this platform will look like with different core facilities. But what is also important as much as uh, our academia, that's the private sector, big pharma companies and R&D centers. So we want to create an R&D center in Europe to become a really global spot for innovations. Of course, this has to be international center. We want to attract people not only for the region, from the region, not only from the Europe, but really from the whole world, because the collaboration is the key. We cannot do it alone. No one can do alone. We need different stakeholders, but also we need, we need as much as we can get uh, a huge amount of gray cells because this is the only way how are we going to tackle all the challenges that are really growing and becoming a dis destruction and a huge problem for every individual on this planet. The key is in communication. We do have a lot of institutes, but figure out, we figure out that we have to bring them together. We have to bring them together with industry. We have to bring them together with the government, with the non-governmental sector, and we have to start collaborating. So I have one more minute, but I want you to see this is going to be a new city in Belgrade. This is going to be a game changer for our science. This is going to be a game changer for science in the whole region. And this is how we see the future development of our country. This is how we see the future development of our innovation ecosystem, through education and through investments in science. So this is our invitation for everyone to join the revolution in biology because all the centuries, I can say there were centuries of mathematics. So this is a constant. It will stay. Then we had the 20th century, the century of chemistry and physics. And now we're, we enter the 21st century with the biology, with the core processes of life and nature. And now we have a technology 
that is starting to change the evolution of all living organisms, including the humans. So imagine the implications of such a powerful technology to our lives in the very near future. That's it, right? Okay. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, my invitation. So please visit Serbia and Belgrade before Expo 2027. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, an excellent opportunity for you to see. We're starting to build this city at the end of this year. So we're planning to finish it in two years. Space for companies, space for uh, universities, space, space for scientists, and space for all the smart people in this world. Thank you very much. Now, first of all, I would like to thank you for being here today with us. And now uh, we're at your disposal. If you have any questions, any comments, anything that you know can uh, be a start of communication of, I think, crucial themes and the changes that are ahead of us. Please. Good morning. Thank you so much for your presentations. My name is Tetenda Murigo. I'm a global shaper from the Harare Hub, and I'm a biotechnology and biochemistry student at the University of Zimbabwe. Um, I would like to ask about biotech innovators within the space of science education. Um, how can we create more space for people who want to promote education for younger students, particularly people within primary and secondary education? Um, one example that I could give would be creating of molecular biology kits that can be used in underprivileged communities, uh, whereby they don't have access to uh, the physical laboratory, but they still need to learn certain aspects of molecular biology, appreciation of it. Um, how best can we support biotech innovators within the science education space? Thank you. Okay, yeah, well, uh for the science, it's becoming really clear that we have to start with education as soon as possible because we need new generations that understand new technologies. This goes the same with uh, AI. For instance, in Serbia, we introduce uh, the programming uh, and AI from the elementary school from the first uh, first grade of elementary school, from the fifth grade, they already are learning Python and different AI, AI tools. But this goes the same with the, with the biotech. Uh, yes, I completely agree that uh, some kits uh, can be developed, uh, and actually, uh, you can isolate DNA without any kind of kit. You know, you need a juice, you need some uh, ice and some alcohol, and you can really demonstrate to the kids what, what is uh, DNA and some similar kits can, can be really applied. Also, I think we should use more uh, informational technologies uh, through, for instance, YouTube. You can find such amazing lectures on basics of molecular biology, chemistry, physics, uh, that are that can, you know, understand a regular person that is not, come, that, that it's uh, not uh, uh, in this uh, art or, uh, it can be understood by a kid, but I think we should focus, and I agree, we should focus on uh, younger generations because it's very difficult to foresee what is ahead of us, and we have to prepare them uh, for the new jobs, for the new challenges that are very hard to foresee at this uh, moment. But then again, collaboration and centers like this uh, and centers in your country that are promoting science within young populations are, are very, very important. I would just add also that it's, also, it's, it's what you focus on as well. So the rise of everything that ministers talked about is, under, is underpinned by computational biology, a lot of it actually. And bioinformatics doesn't need a wet lab for the most part, you need data. And if you have the data and you have a laptop, you can be a scientist now in a way that you could never be before. So I would also encourage countries which, and, and places where if you don't have access to a wet lab, focus on what you do have access to and you know, double down on that. Yes, yes. 
Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for a very insightful presentation. Uh, I think synthetic biology is the buzzword these days. Uh, my name is uh, Amit Kakkar. I'm an MD in oncology and nuclear medicine, uh, working with Nova Holdings. Uh, we are part of the Nova Nordisk Foundation, very actively involved in both life science and sustainability investments. Uh, we do have innovation hubs uh, in Copenhagen right now, and we're looking to see what we can do across the world. I think one of the key questions is, where does the innovation come from? Do you have the basic pool of innovators like academia and other innovators in Serbia right now? And I apologize, I'm not being rude here. No, no, absolutely. I, I don't have any idea about that. And because we see that at academia, I, I live in Singapore, and we see that coming in from ASTAR, NUS, China, it comes from CAS, Peking University, Copenhagen, it's from Aarhus, uh, CPH Business School. So can you elaborate a little bit more about the Serbian ecosystem where academia is concerned? Absolutely. So uh, the innovations come both from uh, the industry and academia. So we worked a lot on uh, structuring the system because we uh, were facing the situation where, you know, the invention is there and they start to somehow develop it towards innovation. And then in that chain, in that pipeline, something was missing. So we had to build stronger supporting system from uh, the identification of innovation to explaining to scientists, uh, particularly in the areas where every single paper is also kind of innovation, uh, how to overcome th those borders that they were in, uh, you know, uh, uh, in their brains, in their minds, uh, and how to pursue innovation and what are the benefits, you know, of becoming an entrepreneur. We don't expect, of course, that everyone will be entrepreneurs. It's not a good thing because, you know, where, where the world will go, in which direction if everyone were entrepreneurs. So you always have in a population a percentage of those who are really willing to risk. And the change mind of mind setup that a, a failure to fail is a good thing is also a process that I see also in Europe that it's still a problem. So we are working a lot with uh, uh, faculties, with research institutes, with individual scientists, through different trainings, to, through different uh, visits uh, to other ecosystems, just to uh, create a minimum uh, number of those who are willing to try. And we were very su successful in ICT. Of course, when we talk about biotech, it's a completely different story. It's highly risk, it's very, it takes a long time, uh, it takes high, in, highly, uh, high investments, so it's 10 times everything compared to ICT. Uh, but nevertheless, we decided that we will support. And now we have a growth in number of uh, companies that are biotech and combination of, uh, particular combination of AI and bio, AI and medicine. So we are now uh, with the most of the, we have mostly uh, innovations in this field, but we see now that other fields are growing, particularly in agri-tech agri uh, and, uh, and medicine. But it's a process. I would also just add on that, that um, as an investor, what makes the Biofor campus so interesting is that it becomes a hub for the region. And there is currently no hub in that region. The hubs in Europe are in you know, the UK, Switzerland, Denmark, as you mentioned, um, Spain to some extent now with you know, Moderna and, and um, BMS moving their um, large R&D facilities there. But there is no hub in Serbia or in the Balkans yeah. or in Turkey or in Egypt or in any of the countries there. And by building this, the smartest people from those places will go to Serbia now at least as a starting point, because it's a lot more, you know, it's a lot easier and it's a lot more um, valuable. And I'm deeply impressed with what's going on in your beautiful country. Belgrade is an amazing city, Serbia is an amazing country, and you really have to go. Mentioning the age of biology and life sciences, mentioning this huge hub you are building, I give you Maybe it's not an advice, but an idea. You mentioned Demis Asabis and AlphaFold. 
This is a fantastic story. I think building up this center, this amazing vision for Serbia, you have to tell stories. You have to tell who are the ones who make the biggest achievements. What is their story? People always connect with stories. You know, it's easy to say we are the this and do this and this and this. But if you add a face on it, a story to it, we, it's better to connect. And I really encourage you to come to Belgrade. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning. I'm the Global Shaper from the Shenzhen Hub. Uh, my name is Chun Li Deng. Uh, in Chinese, Deng Chun Li. Uh, I have a very close connection with Serbia because I volunteered in the United Nations Resident Coordinate Office in Serbia in 2021. And oh. I participate in many uh, sustainable projects uh, based, on, based in Serbia, such as the green economy, green agro, agriculture, and as the role of our office, we need to negotiate among the governments, NGOs, private sectors, and other stakeholders. So my question is, uh, like when it comes to the age of biology and life science, sorry, should I stand up? No, no, yeah. that's okay. And, um, so how can we to, uh, to negotiate with different stakeholders and to mobilize the resources and impacts among the stakeholders. Also, the impacts and good, a good story uh, at the regional level and the global level, yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, you know, uh, we're all uh, representatives of different countries and uh, on a different levels, if we talk about uh, uh, innovations, uh, Science, I think science is good everywhere. Uh, th there are regions and countries that are better in this field or that field, better in mathematics, uh, better in some, some other areas. Uh, but for the innovation system, you have to create it and you have to communicate. I totally agree with all, all the stakeholders. But it's also important that the government is supporting for instance, uh, such a big, uh, big uh, investments and uh, big projects. So you need a strong governmental uh, support. You need the government who is willing to change uh, uh, even the legal framework in order to be more supportive and more attractive, whether to scientists or to the private sector, so you can attract more companies uh, to, your, to your country. Also, the communication with the public is becoming very important because biotech, as I said at a certain point, you know, uh, people are uh, extremely happy, uh, but also you have uh, citizens that are, you know, becoming scared of these new technologies. So constant communication is also uh, important, and we we are planning to to make uh, some um, uh, one uh, multimedia, multifunctional. Uh, center something between art and biotech so we can really communicate with citizens uh, you know so we don't end up in with situation you know that we have fear in the in, a, in societies and this is going to be more and more intense as these technologies advanced uh, as i mentioned we we are starting to change the evolution of our own species so you know when people become aware of it they should be prepared and they should have more knowledge. So communication through media, communication through some uh, public dialogue, uh, it's very, very important for these new technologies. And I don't know whether you want to add something. I think you said it very perfectly, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> okay, we have one more. Okay. One more, no, no more, one more. Oh, that's it? That's it. Okay, they're not giving us a second more than planned. Uh, thank you very much again. And we can continue after this official.